We now move to questions to the Minister of Education. Before I call Mr Harold McKee, I must inform the House that question number 14 has been withdrawn. Mr Harold McKee. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Um, Mr Speaker, I thank the member for his question. The Department of Education is not the employer of teachers or ancillary staff in schools. The role of my department in the employment of teachers relates to uh, the teachers' terms and conditions, which are negotiated through the forum of the Teachers' Negotiating Committee, in which my department is represented. Teachers' terms and conditions, including pay, uh, are negotiated through the, the Teachers' Negotiating Committee. That applies to all teachers in grant-dated schools. Uh, my department is responsible for approving the teacher appointment schemes of the Education Authority and the Council for Catholic uh, Maintained Schools. In terms of uh, a more limited role in terms of ancillary staff, uh, my department has no role in the employment of ancillary staff. Arrangements for the terms and conditions of ancillary staff employed by the Education Authority are negotiated through the Joint Negotiating Council. Uh, and that, at that council, we would have a smaller role than in the teaching side of it. Uh, my department has observer status on the council. Arrangements for the terms and conditions of other ancillary staff will be a matter for the individual boards of governors within schools. And, my, and in those cases, my department has no role at all. Mr. McKee, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answer this far. According to the DUP manifesto, the party is committed to ending the Article 71 exemption for teaching from the Fair Employment and Treatment Order. What plan does the Minister have to put this into action? Well, strictly speaking, that would actually lie outside uh, my direct jurisdiction. In terms of Article 71 on Fair Employment, I, I, certainly I agree that I think it's something that needs to be removed. Directly speaking, the, um, the legislation which is responsible for that, but doesn't lie within the Department of Education, it lies within the Executive Office, and I know there's ongoing work within that to, uh, to deal with that. That's something I think which is in line with previous, uh, it's been previously been highlighted, I think, for instance, by the Equality Commission uh, from some, I think it was the Equality Commission uh, some time ago, but the legislation that would, that would be there to repeal that and try to ensure that we have a, a level playing field as regards um, teacher employment. Uh, lies within the, the executive office rather than the Department of Education. However, I think it's important that we reach a situation in which any artificial barriers towards employment, particularly where there is an exclusion, I think that is something which is a relic of the past. And I think it's something that we do need to, to move on. Call Mr. Justin Mackinall. Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers thus far. Can the Minister update the Chamber on what actions he has taken to address lengthy precautionary suspensions of staff, which are costing the Executive millions of pounds per year? Well, in terms of the precautionary suspensions, again, it, it's important to note that uh, as we are not, the Department is not the direct employer of teachers, it's also not directly involved in employment matters. And that would include, for instance, on the issue of precautionary suspension. Teachers are employed by the relevant boards of governors, and as such, employment decisions, such as precautionary suspensions, are actually decisions that are taken by individual boards of governors. Now, we monitor uh, all cases of precautionary suspension, uh, paying due regard to the role of, of employer. And indeed, from February of this year, the accounting officer of the employer's authorities has been asked to provide assurance to the chief accounting officer of, of the department at governance and account, uh, accountability review. Meetings that, uh, that all such cases have been subject to monthly case review and necessary action taken. So I think it's, it is an ongoing issue in that regard. Decisions in relation to precautionary suspension are not taken arbitrarily. They're taken by employers, and that's the Board of Governors in consultation uh, with the relevant employment authorities. Again, we're not the relevant employment authority, so the department doesn't, we don't have a direct role to uh, directly intervene. We don't have a power within that. We can try and, where possible, influence that, that basis. I, I would say in terms of suspensions, there tends to be, I think, if, uh, 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 given a comparison with other jurisdictions, they tend to be a lot less frequent here. There's, there's a greater level of security of tenure um, within, within positions on it. But again, it, it is ultimately up to the individual boards of governors and the employing authorities. So at best, we can try and be an influencer for progress and for good, rather than have a direct role of, of intervention. 
call Mrs. Carla Locker. Mr. Speaker, and can I ask uh, the Minister, thank him for his uh, answers thus far, uh, can I ask the Minister what his department is doing to tackle long-term suspensions and, uh, of staff and the cost that that actually can be to school budgets? Well, I think from that point of view, yes, there is a potential uh, cost to school budgets in, on that basis, and I think we've all got to ensure that, particularly as, the, as schools are under a high level of pressure with the aggregated schools budget, uh, that those are kept to, to a minimum. As I said, our, our problem is that in terms of um, the terms and conditions of that, it, it does something that lies directly outside the control of the department. So we're trying to think to influence and send a positive signal to schools about the, the need to, to um, deal particularly on, on the issue of precautionary suspensions as swiftly as possible. I think it's important to think, if you're talking about the issue of precautionary suspensions, that while due process has always got to follow under those circumstances, I think it's in nobody's interest, and whether it's the school itself, whether it's the budgetary position, whether it's the, the teacher who has got that, um, that precautionary suspension, it, it's in no one's interest for that to drag on any longer than is necessary um, on, that, on that basis. But again, given that I think it's quite a significant step, I think to be fair to schools, I don't think that they would um, take the step of a precautionary suspension, and indeed this may also be in circumstances where it needs to be some level of protection there for the particular children. So consequently, it's not something which is just done very lightly. I think, it's, I think most schemes act in a very responsible manner. And where there is a precautionary suspension, it's, it's one that is, is weighed very heavily before that action is taken. Well, Mr. Declan Kearney. Thank you, Minister, for your answer so far. Could you give us an update, Minister, in relation to the investing in the teacher uh, workforce scheme, please? In terms of the uh, position on the Investing in Teacher Workforce Scheme, uh, the scheme itself has been launched. It, it was something that um, received executive approval. I know that uh, the previous minister had, had admitted something that was quite similar sort of before. Uh, the executive has agreed for it to go forward on the basis of a pilot scheme for 2016-17 with uh, about 120 teachers who would be, uh, or sorry, 120 posts that would be eligible. Um, now, I think there has, been, uh, there has been an indication, I think, from uh, at least one person of a potential sort of legal challenge to that, and we will have to see whether that comes forward on that basis. But I think there is a great opportunity uh, there, and it's been one, to be fair, which has been welcomed, I think, by um, the teaching workforce and by the, the, by, particularly by the trade unions as a positive way forward. The principal aim of this, although it will also have a, a benefit towards schools' budgets, the principal aim is to try to have a degree of, of refreshment of the teaching workforce. Now, there is a, a longer-term issue uh, in terms of the profile of our teaching workforce and a concern which is there as to whether, if you like, the numbers that, that are coming through in teacher training uh, exceed the number of posts that are available. And I think that that is something which will need to be tackled um, in, a, in a wider context. What I would say is that even if we were in a position today if the executive were in a position to announce any change on that, you're then talking about people entering uh, teacher training um, who would then potentially graduate in a few years' time. You, you know, you're, you're talking about a situation that it would be five to ten years before you'd see any particular benefit in that. And I'm acutely aware of a situation, therefore, that we are having quite a large number of recently qualified teachers um, who then aren't able to gain posts. And I think this is an opportunity. It's a potential win-win um, in terms of enabling some uh, less qualified or sorry more newly qualified teachers to enter the profession while at the same time then being able to release on an entirely voluntary basis uh, teachers some teachers who are between 55 and 59 and being in a situation where that not only has to be applied by that in, by that individual but then also approved by a school because there will be some schools will take a view that that uh, they don't want to let particular members of staff go call mr sydney anderson uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Okay. Again, I thank the member for the question. Uh, the Education and Training Inspectorate, which is more commonly referred to as ETI, has a statutory function to monitor, inspect, and report on the standard of education in schools on behalf of the Department of Education to promote the highest standards of um, education in the interests of the pupils. Inspection ensures best practice is highlighted and shared, that poor provision is identified, supported and improved, and it contributes to the building capacity for ongoing improvement. The current inspection data shows that from the 1st of September 2009 
to the 31st of August uh, 2016. Over that seven year period, 504 schools, to give you a breakdown, 428 of those were primary schools and 76 were post primary schools, have been rated by the Education and Training Inspector as either very good or outstanding. Uh, I would also note that from the 1st of September 2015, uh, ATI changed its overall effectiveness reporting model from a six point to a four point scale, which hopefully will make it uh, more accessible. The descriptors for over, uh, overall effectiveness or, of very good or outstanding were amalgamated and became a new conclusion for overall effectiveness known as high level of capacity for sustained improvement. Mr. Anderson, for supplementary. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his detailed uh, response? And uh, maybe I could take this opportunity to congratulate uh, a school from my own constituency, Bacomber Primary School in Portadown, who recently uh, achieved an outstanding rating by the, the Education uh, uh, and Training Inspectorate. But, Minister, can I ask you, uh, what is the Department's approach towards raising standards in our schools? First of all, I join indeed with, with all schools which have received um, good reports. Uh, I suppose as MLA, sometimes we're perhaps glad there isn't an, an education or the training inspectorate for us to, to rate whether we're good, outstanding or otherwise. Um, I'm sure all members would, would fly through with, with uh, flying colours in that regard. But in, in terms of supplementary, the department's uh, school improvement policy, every school a good school, sets out an overarching approach to raising standards and tackling underachievement in all schools. It focuses on promoting factors that uh, local and international evidence tells us are the core characteristics of a school. It aims to support school leavers, leaders, sorry, boards of governors and teachers in implementing good practice in their school to address any barriers to learning that pupils uh, might face and to improve outcomes for all pupils. And I think one of the things that we sometimes forget whenever the focus is very much on, on delivery within schools is that the, the ultimate goal of all of this is to try to ensure that we get good results for all our pupils and they should be the focus ultimately uh, in relation to that. Alongside the work of teachers, school leavers, uh, boards of governors and managing authority, inspection I believe is a critical component of school improvement. The Department's School Improvement Policy and Inspection Service is already closely aligned uh, with both being focused on promoting improvement and the interest of all learners. Uh, this alignment isn't just something that's written in documents, its procedures have been introduced to follow up on all published inspection reports so that outstanding or very good practice can be shared, areas for further improvement are identified and addressed, and where provision is less than satisfactory additional support is provided. Every school at Google School states that sustained improvement comes from within a school, and inspection is really a catalyst and enabler for improvement. There's a strong link between internal self-examination and external assessment undertaken through inspection so that hopefully then an inspection becomes a continuum of improvement. It's not something that simply sets apart from the work that's ongoing within the school. Call Mrs. Rosemary Bart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your answers so far. C could you, Minister, indicate how schools in formal intervention process are being supported to achieve the standard expected by the inspector and needed by our young people when a large number of the support staff have exited the EAs by the voluntary exit scheme? I think in terms of the, um, in terms of the support that is available, uh, I mean, mentions been made about the EA, uh, about sort of the, the voluntary exit scheme. I mean, at the end of the day, we've actually got to have a financial regime which is beneficial as possible to, to all schools. And in many ways, if the choice is between making some level of cuts within the EA, or alternatively ensuring that the money goes to the frontline services. I think that that's where that, that has to happen. In terms of the um, support which I think all schools should be receiving, uh, there is obviously a limited level of resources. Um, however, the focus of support has always been to provide post-inspection support to schools that are eligible for support through the formal intervention process. Now, I think what we try and do within the formal intervention process is to try and focus in those finance finite resources and they're prioritised to where need is greatest and where capacity for self-improvement uh, has needs support. So, you know, I think it's about a, a working exercise between ETI um, and the individual school to try and raise those standards and address the individual problems. Um, you know, I think it's, shall we say, the, to slightly um, adjust the previous line, they always say that 
uh, all happy families are, are very much the same. All unhappy families are sometimes in, in, uh, uh, unhappy in different ways. And where there are any degree of problems within schools, sometimes it can be for a myriad of reasons, and it can be, um, there can be different problems that need addressed. So it's about addressing those individual problems. I think we should always focus on the fact that in terms of formal intervention, I can appreciate that from a school's point of view, they will have a feeling that this is damaging to their reputation. It's difficult on that, on that basis. But the focus always should be about providing that degree of help towards the, the pupils. And if, if help is needed, then it needs to go in by way of, of formal intervention. But that's obviously very much a, a last step in terms of self-improvement. Call the Chair of the Education Committee, Mr Barry McIldoff. Uh, uh, Corley, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Mr Anderson's question relates to how schools are rated by the inspectorate. Uh, my question is, who rates the inspectorate? And uh, who inspects the inspectorate, the ETA? And is there an argument to be made that the That's three questions, ed Mr. Education Mark and Training Inspectorate could perhaps be independent? I suppose in terms of testing within schools, sometimes we're faced with the issue of multiple choice questions. Um, <laughs> and you can give a range of answers. I, I, I appreciate the Chair has given me a multiple range of, of questions rather than simply on that side of things. Uh, look, I think ETI is held up to, to strong standards. I mean, I think if we are simply to have bodies monitoring other bodies monitoring others, you know, there's, there's a danger of, um, which is sometimes seen in film, that sort of gazing into the, the mirror and the funfair and it's stretching into, into infinitum. Uh, you know, I think from that point of view, there was a report that was brought out, um, and um, from that point of view, I'm not particularly claiming credit, I think it was really largely before my time, before the, the chair's time, of recommendations were. Um, I suppose, if you like, in terms of one of the areas which, which the ETI has held a report is by the Education Committee. And the Educa e Education Committee, in the last mandate, brought out a um, report into inspection and training with a large focus, particularly in ETI. It uh, brought in, into place, I think, 16 recommendations. Of those, I think, uh, 11 of those were directly for ETI itself. And I understand all uh, 11 of those have been uh, implemented. I could list, I suppose, the, the key 11 changes, but uh, I think time would preclude in terms of the, the answer. And indeed, the other five remaining three fall to the department, which I think are being implemented as well. So, I mean, there's a key role, I think, for, the, um, for, the, uh, for both the department, but particularly for the committee in relation to this. And I think particularly given the educational constraints that are in the financial constraints out there, I don't believe it would be particularly good value for public money to be setting up an additional body to scrutinise those who are scrutinising the schools or else, you know, we might be moving into um, observation ad, ad infinitum. Call Mr. Paul Frew. Question number three, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for um, his question. The entitlement framework remains an important component of the statutory curriculum. It's designed to ensure that all learners in key stage four uh, and post-16 have, uh, have access to a broad and balanced range of economically relevant and individually engaging courses. The majority of schools, I think, are meeting that or are very close to meeting the entitlement, uh, framework, entitlement framework requirements in full. This is a significant achievement in challenging times and an anxious that we retain and build upon the benefits that have been accrued so far. I'll be considering the way forward for the entitlement framework over the coming weeks, including the statutory requirements. For a supplement. I thank the Minister for his question, uh, Mr Speaker, but can the Minister be more specific around the current rate of compliance on the entitlement framework? Currently, I suppose to give a, uh, a perspective in relation to this, at Key Stage 4, schools are required to offer at least 24 courses, and in the post-16 uh, category, 27, in addition to at least one-third of the, the forces, courses must be, that are offered must be general and one-third uh, applied. Uh, and that's sort of a minimum figure. For the most recent figures that are, are available, there are 66% of schools meet the, the fully meet the requirements at key stage four, and at post-16, the figure is currently 48%. Full compliance requires uh, schools with post-16 provision to be compliant in, at both phases. Using this measurement of 40% of schools were compliant in 15-16. Um, can I say in terms of the, on the numerology on, on that basis, it's also the case that, that in terms of the schools that are not compliant, um, I think there's a total of uh, 59 are, fell short on total course numbers, and 51 of those fall short by uh, a smallish amount in, between 4 
courses or less, i.e. they offered between, for instance, 20 to 23 courses. So we're in a situation where um, there isn't full compliance. To be fair to, I think, the schools, they're trying to operate under very tough financial regime in terms of, in terms of budgets. Uh, and it, it does seem to me that one of the potential ways forward with this, without prejudging any examination that is, is done of that, is to see a greater collaboration between schools. Now, I think particularly with the shared education agenda, that is already beginning to happen. But I think particularly if we're talking about delivery of, of courses, the key aim is to try to ensure that the maximum opportunity is there for uh, pupils. That is not always going to be the case if you're talking about particular subject matters where it's going to attract maybe a relatively small number of pupils. And indeed, that cross-work between schools, I think, is vital to the way forward to try to ensure that the maximum opportunities are provided to all our children. Uh, Minister, while the Ulster Unionist Party welcomes the development of economically relevant courses, does the Minister not agree that we need a fit-for-purpose curriculum that allows for more flexibility in its implementation? I wouldn't disagree with the, the member. I mean, I think we've been in a situation that even if we believe everything within the curriculum is, is perfect at present, and I think there would be some criticism uh, that we're not at that, at that stage, it has been, I think, 10 years since there's been a, a wider curriculum review. Um, so it's certainly been my intention during the lifetime of this assembly to have a review of the curriculum, particularly to try to ensure, and, uh, you know, there's a, a wide range of aspects of that, and I think uh, there will be some aspects that potentially would, would be relevant, particularly to primary schools, but principally, obviously, the focus will be on uh, post-primary provision. And within that, I think there's an issue that, that we do have a great deal of success within Northern Ireland uh, in terms of our academic courses. We've consistently led the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of our success rate. But there may be a question, therefore, to what extent we give enough valuation to vocational courses to ensure particularly that, that, um, uh, that all our children are, are, are prepared, if you like, for the, the life outside the, the classroom on that basis. Uh, sometimes when some people have raised that, and I appreciate this, the, the member is not guilty of this, it has almost been put as a certain either or, that you, you know, reduce the quality of academic to bring up vocational. I think it's important that we ensure that, that, that we protect our academic standards, but at the same time give that greater degree of, of strength to vocational subjects. And I think that will be a key component as we look ahead uh, towards a, a wider curriculum review. I think economically, as, uh, as the member I think has raised the issue, that is a key role um, whenever we come to that, not just for the schools, not just for the departments, but for all stakeholders. And that will include, for instance, the Department of the Economy. It will include uh, the role that can be played in the cross-fertilisation with further education colleges, but also particularly for business organisations. I've already had some level of engagement um, with them as we, we move forward. And I think it's important that some of the developments, for instance, around the skills barometer and around those opportunities are also fed into the, the curriculum to provide those different pathways for our different children. Ms Jennifer McCann. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, would the Minister agree with me that the entitlement framework as it's currently defined actually does give pupils quite a lot of options and choices and in terms of equality of opportunity for all our children and young people will the minister uh, remain committed to that entitlement framework i want to ensure that we get the maximum amount of opportunities for our children i think as i indicated there has been some good work that's been done in this field particularly around the entitlement framework i think it's about trying to build on that success but also trying to look and this is where i think there is an importance particularly between sharing within sectors and between sectors to try to ensure and, you know, I'm aware of um, a number of schools, particularly with the money that's been available from shared education, have focused in some of their projects on ensuring that between, um, for example, I was at the launch of one uh, um, within Bangor of, of uh, three of the schools within the North Down area, where at post-primary level they are having sort of a, a shared project, some of which is, is concentrating on where there are minority subjects which make then that open up and ensure that the access to courses is fully available to all the students. Because if you have a situation where, uh, from a school's point of view, where, for example, perhaps at, a, at an A-level, there's only six or seven pupils within that school who want to take that, that course, in tight economic budgets, there's a danger that, that some schools will look at that simply as this is not economical for them. But uh, if they can work with other schools that are, that are nearby, then to provide a class which, which creates an economy of scale, that can be helpful to the school, both economically. It can be helpful from a sharing point of view because that will be very much on the basis of a, um, of sort of a, a cross-community basis. But it is also going to be a situation where 
that keeps open and indeed perhaps opens up additional possibilities in terms of the opportunities there from, uh, for children. So it's important, as I said, that we do recognise where there has been success and try and build on it rather than look at this in a, in a negative fashion. Mr Stephen Fa Mr. Speaker, I'm building upon the, the last but one answer from the Minister. Can I ask uh, what plans does he have to work with his colleague, the Minister for the Economy, on the creation of a formal 14-19 uh, to 19 strategy uh, for uh, Northern Ireland? And as part of that, what steps can he take uh, to ensure that there's a proper division of labour between schools and FE colleges and avoid the situation that we're seeing recently, where schools are trying to replicate some of the vocational areas where FE colleges have the comparative advantage and also they have this financial incentive to hang on to students when they're actually in their interest uh, to be going somewhere else for their education. I've, I've already, I, I thank the member, I think the member raised a very pertinent point, which is we, we should be seeing as much complementarity within our, our system, and that particularly in terms of the interface between further education colleges and schools in terms of particularly the sixth form provision, that we don't have a situation where there's simply replication and overlap on that basis. I've already um, met with some representatives from the uh, further education side of things, and I think next week, and I suspect maybe corrected in this that the economy minister may be with me. I'm, I'm visiting uh, CERC next week um, to meet the chief executive of CERC, which I know uh, the member is, is very familiar with as, as well. And it's about actually trying within these things in terms of education to look a little bit beyond simply sort of silo solutions and actually see where we can produce a, a kind of joined up approach in relation to that. That's why I said that whenever we come particularly to the issue of uh, curriculum review, that we have a situation where actually all the key stakeholders beyond simply the narrow confines of what have been the, um, the view within education uh, and within the school sector, shall we say, important while they are, that it's not simply confined to that, but there's a key economic driver within that. There's a key role for the Department of the Economy, there's a key role for, for their education colleges, and there's a key role for other outside bodies as well. Before I call Ms. Michelle, McElve McEl Ms. Michelle Gildernew, may I remind members that question number four is a constituency specific question. Ms. Question four, please. Uh, yes, I, I suspect the, the member opposite's um, Irish may be a little bit better than um, the other member that was mentioned uh, in the introduction there. Um, there are currently no major capital projects planned for St Malachy's Primary School, uh, Glencoe, uh, and given the substantial major capital investment programme underway, a further call for projects uh, in terms of major capital announcements is not anticipated in the near future. However, I am considering the merits of making a call in the relatively near future for new projects to be advanced um, in planning under the School Enhancement Programme. Uh, and as the member, I'm sure, will be aware, uh, the programme involves projects to refurbish or potentially extend current school buildings, which in terms of the level of spend um, will be between sort of about half a million and a maximum of, of four million. And therefore, while it will be particularly relevant, I think, to primary schools. And I think the previous SEP call that was made earlier this year was ring fence purely to primary schools. It wouldn't be my intention to do that in this particular, uh, in terms of the next call, but SEPs are particularly advantaged to, to primary schools. A, a minor capital works application is under review for the school as well uh, to provide a new multi-purpose hall and classroom. And a scoping report is being undertaken by the Education Authority, identifying costs at around about half a million for the scheme. Uh, the, this is currently being considered by the department. Due to the reactive nature and the volume of minor works, it's not possible to indicate future plans for future works at the school. At present, only schemes that meet, in terms of minor works, inescapable statutory requirements such as health, safe, uh, health and safety, fire protection, statutory obligations under the Disability Discrimination Act are progressing to delivery. As with a lot of things uh, in terms of minor works or indeed SEP, there is a, a vast estate out there which I would, I would like to be able to be helped, but it's a question, I suppose, ultimately of prioritising and trying to ensure that we get the maximum um, out of the, the system. Ms Gilder, new for a supplementary. Well, thank the Minister for his answer and his, his, as he has alluded to, um, this is an application for a multi-purpose hall uh, which has a specific health and safety requirement. Can I ask the Minister if health and safety requirements attract high priority when his department determines such spending projects? Well, uh, they do attract that now. The scoping report, and from that point of view, has been undertaken by the Education Authority. And from that point of view, health and safety, I think, is one of the key aspects which we're looking at in terms of minor works. Again, the problem is, particularly in terms of the current financial position, that while 
capital budgets are a little bit looser than resource side within education, um, again, the amount that can be done is limited. So therefore, you know, I can't give a, a particular direct commitment given the sheer volume of, of minor works, but obviously it's health and safety tends to be at the, the highest priority with, within that. I think that will be critical in terms of um, any minor works for this school or indeed for any other school. That ends a period for listed questions. We now move to 15 minutes of topical questions. Call Mr. Jerry Mullen. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister uh, to provide an, uh, an update on the, the new bill for Ross Mars Special Needs School and if it's likely to start on the initially proposed date? Um, from that, I don't have the detail to hand just in relation to that particular new build. Um, from that point of view, it's, it's always hopeful, I think, that we try to ensure that, that any new build operates as, as swiftly as possible and indeed in trying to ensure that the, the capital flow of money um, happens that, that uh, we hit targets. I, I will get back to the member on the specifics of that particular case. I think it's particularly pertinent. While, if you like, all sectors are important in terms of being able to provide the right, the right facilities, I think particularly if we're looking at special needs schools, uh, I think there's a particular onus on that. I've had the opportunity uh, to visit a number of, of schools which are in, either in progress or have been um, completed in terms of special needs. And I think it's remarkable to see some of the provision that, that is there. And so, for example, and I appreciate it's outside the members' constituency, but as part of the Stuhl campus, Arvalee, which was the first one which was effectively fast-tracked on that basis, uh, is dealing as, as a schools very specifically within the, the broader Roma area for special needs. And again, I think um, some of the provision that is, is there can remark me good. But in terms of the details of the individual school, I'll be happy to get back to the, the member on that. Mr. Mullen, for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer so far? Um, but considering, Minister, that there's been such a huge number of people who have been expressing concerns uh, around the fact that there's been so limited provision uh, during summer holidays and holiday periods. Uh, can you give to me a, a guarantee that you'd consider uh, extending extracurriculum activities uh, for the school to ensure these children get the additional support they need? I'll look at any proposals that are, that are brought forward. I think one of the things which I think is very useful in terms of generally uh, school, uh, new school build is there's a much greater awareness nowadays of the need, if you like, for provision outside of the normal school hours. Not simply, I think, to the children that use the school, but to the wider community. I'm talking, if you like, uh, generally. I can obviously look at the very specific uh, case that the, the member has raised. Um, you know, if you go back a number of years, there was, I think, probably a tendency, go back 40, 50 years, for a school almost to be, um, you know, I, I'm tempted to say sort of almost it was something that discouraged uh, communities from using it. It was a situation in which barriers were kind of put. Now, I think. One of the things that, that has struck me in terms of a, a lot of the new builds that have been around and seeing indeed where there are new builds in process is there's very much a thinking of how can we actually uh, be able to make the school accessible beyond simply the, the hours of the classroom. And I think that, that I would hope that that would be something that can be borne in mind. As I said, as regards to the very specifics of um, the issues around um, you know, use of the school, particularly during the summer period, uh, I think sort of that can certainly be, be looked at, and if there's a specific proposal, I'm sure it can be considered. It may well be that in terms of the arrangements of that will also be dependent upon what both the Board of Governors say within the school and also possibly the Education Authority uh, as well. Question number two has been withdrawn. I call Mr William Irwin. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister will be aware of an issue that I have raised with the EA regarding traffic congestion around Tondagee Primary School and the impact it is having on residents in the vicinity of that school. Uh, can the Minister provide an update uh, in relation to this important issue and any measures the EA are pursuing to alleviate that problem? Well, I know uh, the Member has been very proactive on this particular issue um, and I welcome his involvement. Um, obviously, directly speaking, again, it is one which, from a, a practical point of view, um, it's not one that is directly involved in the department, but obviously we will keep a, a level of monitoring briefly in place to ensure that, uh, that there is delivery on this. Uh, from discussions that we've had with the Education Authority, they've informed uh, me that following discussions with the School Board of Governors and also Transport NI, there has been a revised planning application. This issue has been submitted on the 27th of September. Uh, once implemented, um, and indeed 
I suppose one can never prejudge a planning application. But if, it's, if the planning application is accepted, once implemented, uh, the new revised scheme would ensure that uh, adequate traffic management systems are in place and hopefully that congestion around Tandagay would be alleviated. Mr. Herwin, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. Uh, is there any time frame? Can the Minister state whether or not there is a time frame for this? Well, again, I suppose we're slightly dependent in terms of there appears to be a suggestion that there is no particular concerns that have been raised with the planning application, as with any of these things. Uh, I think there is always an attempt made to try to ensure that, that what is put forward is something that is broadly speaking acceptable before it reaches that point. Again, the direct involvement is with the Education Authority, and they have informed me that subject to their own internal processes to make funding available uh, and subject obviously to planning permission being granted, uh, they would intend to have the works completed by the end of March 2017, so we would be talking about really about five months away by the end of this financial year and certainly be in place for the, um, uh, for the next school year. Call Mr. Colin McGrath. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Um, would the Minister agree with me that it's a most unusual situation that his department, under uh, Article 26 of the Education Order 96, recognises the Body Bear Trust as a school, yet the Education Authority don't seem too keen to send pupils to it because they state that the evidence supporting the type of education is inconclusive? Well, I've met on a number of occasions. I mean, I'm aware of the good work that has been done by Body Bear, and I've met particularly Brendan McConville on a number of occasions. The issue from that point of view will be about the individual placement of, of individual children and what is best for their individual needs. Um, and from that point of view, there clearly at times has been um, a view taken by some education authority um, officers that, that, uh, you know, as to where the best placement will be. And I think that, that's also about an issue of trying to ensure that there is a um, if you like, sort of a, a mixture of children also to be able to provide the best, uh, the best quality for that individual. Uh, where there has been then an acceptance, um, Buddy Bear in, in that sense therefore isn't a direct formal school within the, the system, but there is provision that where there has been an educational placement, and that has happened at Buddy Bear, it has happened at some other schools that lie outside the formal education process, um, funding then follows the event with that, and I think from that point of view, that's, that's right and proper, but I mean, I think we've got to ensure that we get the best possible setting for every child. It's something from that point of view the department can't micromanage because in terms of placements on special needs, that is something which relies directly with the um, individual actions of the education authority. I think there's also in terms of what the best way forward, um, in terms of conductive education, for example, there will also be a, a pertinent view within this in terms of the, um, the issue of, of the health department and particularly with health workers. So it's about trying to get that, that uh, mix of views and uh, to face in the right direction. Mr McGrath for a supplementary. Thank you very much and I thank the Minister for that answer. But would the Minister agree to maybe uh, some officials from his department meeting with uh, counterparts in EA and representatives from the school, if only to try and sort out that confusion and allow everybody to know where they stand going forward? Well, in terms of, I think it can be made very clear that the power lies particularly with the um, with the EA in relation to that. It's interesting though, I think there, there are opportunities as well for Buddy Bear also, I think, and this is where I think there needs to be a bit of thought given. Uh, there was a report produced um, by ETI in 2013 in relation to Buddy Bear, and I think the feeling is that the, the recommendation of that report was, um, no pun intended, but a sort of a buddy arrangement with particularly Spurnview Special School to look at actually where there can be uh, structures within that to establish informal links. And I think that, that uh, while it wasn't taken up at the, at the time, I think that, that would be a good opportunity because I think it is, while Buddy Bear is in that sense independent directly of the system, I think the stronger links that it can build between its provision and what is there already within the system will actually be something that would be, would be helpful. And I, I think that's something which certainly I've spoken to my officials to see if that can be explored. But ultimately, that will also then require a degree of choice from the schools uh, themselves on it to ensure that we give them the maximum amount of help to these very special kids. Call Mr. Pachi here. Can I ask the Minister to explain how his department is bringing forward the children and young persons strategy in terms of uh, consultation and engagement with uh, relevant stakeholders? Well, in terms of the children and young persons uh, strategy, we'll be working on that 
uh, on that issue, if you just if you give me a moment. Uh, as part of that strategy, it's going to seek to outline how the executive will work cooperatively. Now, uh, I'm aware that the Children's Services Cooperation Act, for instance, um, must be laid by the second week. In terms of time scale, the intention will be to, to lay that before the Assembly and to give that level of scrutiny in the second week of uh, December. It is important, I suppose, as part of that, and that's where probably I would hope that these things will move, uh, will move sort of ahead reasonably quickly. Um, it's important that that strategy aligns with the programme for government. And as such, obviously, we're waiting for the final draft of the programme for government to ensure that is aligned. Uh, there is a concern, obviously, that, that might lead to a slight degree of delay um, within that. But certainly, if it's not possible to meet the December deadline, we'll be looking for the final strategy to be laid in the Assembly early in the new year. But I think it's important that any of the strategies that are emerging from each of the departments align with the, the overall global position of the programme for government. Just come from a meeting this morning with Conrad Nagiliga, and they welcomed the fact that children from Irish Medium Education have been consulted by the department. Uh, and I just wanted to ask the minister: Will he ensure that his, his minister or his department continues to consult and engage with children from Irish Medium Education, so that? Uh, they can gain a, an understanding as to the expectations of those children for the future in terms of uh, access to goods and services, dealing with government departments and public bodies through the Irish language. I think it's important that we have um, consultation taking place from a very wide range of, of sectors and indeed children from a, a wide range of backgrounds. Uh, mention has been made because obviously until the strategy is laid that we can't have the absolute final position. However, while there hasn't been formal consultation, um, in terms of that, there's already been informal co-design in terms of the strategy with a wide range of stakeholders that have been taking place uh, by the department. That directly includes children and young people from all backgrounds, and it's important that all backgrounds are then uh, part of that. And that informal consultation, because sometimes I suppose we get very much hung up on the, the processes of direct formal consultation, which themselves are important, but if we can use that informal consultation, which actually then has informed the final strategy. I think it is something that, that can ensure that hopefully the final strategy is one that's very much fit for purpose. And in terms of that consultation with a widest range of, of stakeholders and individuals, and particularly children and young people from every conceivable background, I think it's important that that will continue. You can have the assurance that that, that will continue with all, uh, with all sort of a wide range of, of children. Call Mr. Sammy Douglas. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I ask the Minister what support his department has given towards nursery provision in East Belfast? Well, the Department uh, of Education funds the preschool education programme, which aims to ensure that at least one year of preschool education is available to every family that it wants. Uh, that provides one year of non compulsory education and builds upon the learning. Now, and indeed, experience of that, 99% uh, of 99.9% .9 of target age children are, who are of parents who are fully engaged with this year's admissions process were offered a funded place. It's also the case that uh, following the publication of Learning to Learn, the department introduced a new procedure to now have greater level of flexibility for a classroom. The level of provision available in the East Belfast constituency also increased recently when there was a development proposal for additional preschool places at Dundonald Primary School was approved. So from September 2016, the number of part-time preschool places at that setting has doubled from 26 to 52. Mr. Douglas, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer thus far. Um, can I ask the Minister, have, have any of, of the nursery units in East Belfast been successful in obtaining temporary flexibility in nursery places? I think from that point of view, um, there has been now a provision which, in terms of nursery units, um, I suppose up until a couple of years ago there was a very rigid approach taken in terms of the numbers, and that didn't necessarily accommodate uh, the opportunities and deep pressures that were there. Uh, that was changed a couple of years ago, and there have been two nursery units in East Belfast, uh, Knocknagoni Primary and Dundonald, uh, used that process to request temporary flexibility. Uh, now, that led to additional places being approved in each of those settings, uh, although a further place in Knocknagoni wasn't approved, it was not considered 
uh, necessary to meet the needs of the area. Members, time is up. That ends the period of questions to the Minister of Education. I ask the members to take their ease while we change the top table.